Today's topic is on solutions and how they form. Uh, some of the terms, some of the uh, concepts that are based around the uh, formation of solutions and some of the parts that make up every solution. Uh, first of all, uh, solutions are a homogeneous mixture. So way back at the beginning of the year we talked about different types of matter and a homogeneous mixture at that time, if you go back and check your notes, is a mixture. So it has a variable composition. Uh, homogeneous though meaning that it has one phase and so this is a one phase mixture and it contains specific parts that when we're talking about solutions we refer to as a solvent and one or more solutes. The solvent is the part of the solution that is in the majority. In other words there's more solvent than there is solute and the solvent is what is actively dissolving the solute, pulling it apart and we'll talk more about that in a moment. The solute is this, the part of the solution that is in the minority and there can be more than one solute in a solution. In fact, most solutions that you use every day, from things you drink to uh, shampoo to gasoline in your car, uh, in these solutions there is almost always multiple solutes, sometimes dozens. Uh, and we kind of just take those for granted, but there's generally just considered to be one solvent. So the solute is in the minority, and it's what's being dissolved by the solvent. Even when there are many solutes, they are often in the vast minority of what's in the solution. Water, for example, in many common solutions is you know, 90 percent or more of what you've actually got there. So what is this dissolving exactly? We talk about this verb and sort of take it for granted and just assume that we always know what it means. But dissolving uh, is the process by which solutions form. And dissolving is actually a two-part process. So it's sort of two, var two verbs in one. The first is the process of dissociation or dissociating and this is what happens when a solute, uh, is the particles of a solute are pulled apart from each other by the solvent particles. And so the solute particles, for example, sugar or salt being dissolved into water, the solute particles or molecules, ions, are pulled apart from each other by the solvent particles, or the water in many solutions that we'll use in class. And I'll show you some diagrams of what this looks like here in just a moment. But the dissociation is sort of like the opposite of association. Think about an association of, of schools that form together under some umbrella. Uh, the N North Dakota High School Activities Association, for example, consists of many high schools all grouped together. Well, this is the opposite of that, where those many pieces are not going together but are coming apart or being pulled apart. And solvation is the second part of the process. During solvation, the solute particles that are now pulled apart, separate, are then, are then surrounded by solvent particles in order to keep them apart. Solvation is necessary to, to make the dissociation sort of more long-lasting or semi-permanent. And solvation is the surrounding then of a solute particle with usually many solvent particles. And it makes what's called a complex or sometimes called a solvated or if it's water you'll hear it called a, a hydrated complex. And we'll look at some examples of that later on in the, in the uh, quarter. But for now, the process of dissociation and then solvation together makes dissolving. And you can see the word dissolving contains parts of both those words. So a way to think about it with water, which is our most common solvent in chemistry, at least in inorganic chemistry for sure, uh, water is a very polar molecule. And so that means it has a positive end, or in the case of water, it has these two uh, positive ends, the, the white hydrogen atoms in this diagram, and then it has a negative end, the red oxygen end of the molecule. And if you remember back from bonding, that has to do with the fact that oxygen has a uh, fairly large electronegativity. And so in each of the, the uh, polar covalent bonds of the water molecule, the electrons being shared by the two atoms are pulled uh, more strongly toward the oxygens end of the molecule. And so as you see it pictured here, the left side or the oxygen side of the molecule would be slightly negative and the other end, the hydrogen side, would be slightly positive. That gives um, water sort of a, almost like a, a magnet personality where it has a positive and a negative end, like a magnet would have a north and a south. And so when a compound then is being dissolved by water, it's usually made possible by the fact that water has a positive and a negative end that can attract then to uh, negative and positive ends of something else. Kind of like a north um, pole on a magnet can pick up the south pole of another magnet. And so solvated ions then, as you see in this picture, would be the green or purple spheres. This is an example, a picture of sodium chloride being dissolved, but the same sort of idea would be true for any ionic compound. 
you see here on the left side uh, we have green chlorides. Here's one on the top right corner of the, of the picture being surrounded by five water molecules which are shown here as gray. Now the number five is not necessarily that important but here's a chloride being surrounded by five water molecules and if you look closely in each case the smaller hydrogens are these little ones here those smaller hydrogens are what is pulled toward or turned toward the negative chloride ion and so the hydrogen end is positive and it's turned toward the negative chloride opposites attract down in the bottom right corner you see a purple sodium ion which is positively charged and around it are six water molecules and again the number is not important but in each of those six water molecules the larger oxygen end which is shown in red in most of the molecules the, the red end is turned toward the sodium because the red end of the water is negative 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 all the way around all those negatives then are turned toward or attracted toward the positive sodium ion and what you see then here are two solvated ions a sodium that is surrounded or solvated by a bunch of waters and up here a chloride that is surrounded by a bunch of waters as well and we form those complexes so that chloride and those waters would then move throughout the solution kind of as a, a little unit a little group and they would be a little bit more complicated than just a single ion or a single water molecule so we call them a complex there's a lot to complexes and a lot of cool things in chemistry for now we just want to keep in mind that this basically is necessary so that the sodiums and chlorides aren't reattracted to each other I always describe this as if we're looking at say a hockey fight where players get into a fight during the game and others have to come out and pull them apart and then they're kept separate uh, in the penalty box for a while in order to keep them apart and let them cool down but later in the game if you don't keep them apart and you put them back on the ice at the same time they might find their way right back to each other and start throwing fists again so you have to keep them separated in order to make the separation last a long time as soon as you turn the other way and, and uh, don't pay attention to them they look at each other from across the ice and the fight is on again so we see these positive ends of the waters which again are shown as the little hydrogens here the smaller spheres and then the negative ends of the waters attracted to the oppositely charged ions in each case so when we're looking at a solution forming as you see that in this beaker um, the, the ions the purple and, and green ions that you just saw are being pulled apart pulled off of a big chunk of say salt at the bottom of this beaker and that process of solvation then is canceled out by or sort of balanced by the idea of crystallization you can see in the zoomed in version here that there are ions being pulled off of the, the, the heap like this positive sodium here or this negative chloride here but there are also uh, positive and negative ions being pulled back in being attracted back into the, the piece and so when we have a solution that's forming in, in a beaker or in a flask often there are there are particles being pulled off but there are also particles being added back on so solvation and crystallization kind of cancel each other out like melting and freezing or heating and cooling uh, oxidation and reduction like we talked about earlier in the semester and when both of these things are happening at the same rate we've achieved what we call solution equilibrium and at that point uh, there is no net change because the amount of dissolving is equal to the amount of recrystallizing or solvation equals crystallization crystallization and so there's no net change this occurs when the water or whatever the solvent might be is holding as much solute dissolved as it can at that temperature and you can sit and stir this all day and you won't see any more crystals dissolve if we've done the Kool-Aid lab now we can think back to the dissolving sugar into water for a simple example there comes a point where you can dissolve no more sugar into water same is true of salt or anything else that dissolves into water there's a limit you can keep adding it and stir it and stir it but eventually the crystals will fall to the bottom and that's when you've reached this point solution equilibrium where there's no more uh, dissolving uh, gain anyway uh, because every time something dissolves something else crystallizes and cancels that right out again and this point we, des we describe it as being saturated the word saturated generally means full or some kind of maximum in chemistry or in science at all you hear about it with saturated fats you can hear about it with saturation in, in terms of weather and clouds and all sorts of things but in the, in the type, type of uh, saturation we're talking about here it means we have a saturated solution and it's holding the maximum amount of dissolved solute for that solvent water ethanol or any other solvent at that temperature and that pressure 
We'll talk more about temperature and pressure and how they affect solutions later on in the quarter. So solubility is how we describe then how much can be dissolved before we get to a saturated solution. How much salt does it take? If I have a beaker with 200 milliliters of water in it at room temperature, how much salt, sodium chloride, would I have to dissolve in there in order to get it to be saturated? What's the maximum or what's its capacity? We describe that in terms of its solubility. So solubility of the substance is the amount of solute that must be dissolved in a given quantity of a solvent at a specific temperature and pressure to produce a saturated solution. That's a big definition. Basically it means what conditions uh, would make the solution saturated, would max out the solution. And we mentioned pressure in here because gases uh, dissolve very differently if you increase the pressure or decrease the pressure. Generally we see no difference with solids or liquids in terms of how they combine and make solutions. But gases are greatly affected by pressure. And so that's why we find that our bottled carbonated beverages would be kept under great pressure in order to keep those bubbles in the solution, to keep the fizz in your pop. They increase the pressure uh, of, the, of the can to something like two and a half times normal atmospheric pressure. Usually, oops, pardon me, I'm jumping all over the place. Usually solubility is expressed in terms of how many grams of solute can be dissolved per 100 grams of solvent. So it's grams per hundred. Essentially it's a percentage then. Grams per hundred also means grams per cent. And so when we talk about solubility, often we describe it as a percent solution but it's grams of solute per 100 grams of solvent. And since water is the most common solvent that we run into in chemistry, you'll often see it described and abbreviated like you see here at the bottom, grams of solute per 100 grams of water. Most of our solubilities are described in that way because water is the most common solvent that we run into in this class. But we could switch out just about any solvent in there for water and, and come up with a solubility in, in much the same way. As I mentioned, a solution is called saturated when the maximum amount of solute is dissolved. At that point, there would generally be a few undissolved crystals uh, settling to the bottom. If you want to filter those crystals out, you can do that. Pour it through a filter paper and you'll have a saturated solution that is crystal free. And there are times when it's necessary to do that, especially if you're making something like rock candy from scratch at home. A solution would be called unsaturated if there is less than the maximum amount of solute dissolved. In other words, if the capacity is, say, 55 grams of, of a solute in every 100 grams of water, anything less than 55 grams would make the solution unsaturated. It's holding less than the maximum, whether it's 54 or 53 or 3 or 4 grams. All of those is, are less uh, than the maximum capacity. So we would call that an unsaturated solution. It could hold more and you won't see any crystals undissolved at this point. Most of the time we would see this as a clear solution with particles disappearing into the solution immediately with room for still more. And so you could add more to it at that point. Most of our solutions in everyday life are unsaturated. For example, Kool-Aid, unless you're really sugar high up, um, you could probably add more sugar to your Kool-Aid and get it to dissolve, which proves that your Kool-Aid is unsaturated. Don't take that as a challenge your pancreas will thank you if you don't. And finally, a supersaturated solution is described as a solution in which more than the maximum amount of solute has been dissolved. Now that seems a little bit impossible. How can you hold more than the maximum? Because wouldn't that be the maximum? The idea is important here that a supersaturated solution is very unstable. It won't last for long. It's usually uh, just a, a jiggle away or a slight disruption away from being ruined and turned back to a saturated solution. In order to do this, you more or less have to trick the solvent into holding more than it thinks it should be able to hold. And so to do this, we heat the solvent, usually water, to a warm temperature. We dissolve a large amount of solute at that greater temperature, and then carefully cool the solution down to a lower temperature, like room temperature, uh, without the extra crystallizing back out. This is how we make syrups. If you know anyone who makes their own syrup, um, I grew up with, with uh, family members making choke cherry syrup. My wife makes that. My mother-in-law, my mom, my grandmas, all kinds of folks make syrups um, from juices and sugar. And to do that, you have to heat it up and then cool it down and hope it doesn't crystallize out. Because if it does, you get grainy syrup and it's gross. But this is essentially what you're doing when you make a, a syrup as you're supersaturating. If you've been successful, the solution will be clear 
And again, you're basically tricking the solvent into holding extra. It should be noted that you cannot do this with all solutes. We can't supersaturate sodium chloride, for example, table salt. That'll crystallize back out every time as you try to cool it off. But sugar, as it works out, is quite easily supersaturated, um, which is the, the basis for many of the candies that we take, a, uh, take for granted, from a, a Starburst to a Jolly Rancher to a Tootsie Roll. Those things all take advantage of supersaturated solutions, even things like candy canes. And here's a picture of a supersaturated solution as it's being affected then afterwards. If you start on the left here with a flask that is clear, you won't be able to see anything in this solution. It looks like water or a clear solution. But you can see in this forceps is a tiny crystal being dropped into the, into the flask. And when it hits the surface of the, the water here, the solution, it begins to crystallize and grow into more. This is called the seed crystal. You drop that crystal in there and many more crystals, countless crystals, will grow off of it. Uh, and increase the number that you see here. All of the extra beyond the capacity will crystallize back out uh, around that center seed crystal. You can kind of see it radiating off of the center. And pretty soon, as, as you get to the right side of this picture frame here, the uh, entire flask is full of crystals. Uh, and it will continue to do that often until the, the uh, solution seems to have turned into a solid mass. We'll look next at factors affecting solubility, but that's enough for, for right now. Uh, thanks for listening, and uh, hopefully you've gotten this all into your notes. If not, maybe go back after having listened to it now and, and uh, watch it, pause it, and get those things in your notes soon. Thanks.